Hi everyone, my name is Rachel, and I study material science and engineering. I get a lot of questions about what material science and engineering is, or also known as MATSC or MSC in other schools. I want to address this question in this video. Specifically, I will go over a general scope of what MATSC concepts and subfields are out there. As a researcher, I find that it's helpful to uh, try to get a scope of what a specific large field is and try to understand what kinds of research topics that I might be interested in conducting research on. And so this is the type of video I want to make here where um, I'm introducing different topics for any current MATSI undergrad or a curious student who wants to embark in research. Uh, hopefully this will be helpful for you uh, to try to understand what MATSI is and the types of research that you could be conducting or getting involved with. The type of research that I work with is uh, mostly on electronic, optoelectronic electronic device materials, uh, such as the perovskite solar cell shown here. I work with different devices and trying to understand how they function on a materials level. And so to go more in depth about that, first I want to talk about the four concentrations that materials engineers work with. The first one is with electronics, and with electronics you're working with materials such as going on the circuit chip and going into your computer, or even bigger devices such as with solar panels. You can be working with polymers, looking at chemistry for different applications such as food or agriculture or making different compounds for electronics. You can be working with metals such as steel pipes and trying to improve corrosion resistance for oil and gas industry applications. You can also be working with biomaterials where you're uh, trying to find different materials and improving their properties to interact with certain living tissues such as uh, the cast shown here. And with these MATSC concentrations, there are three core topics that every materials engineer should know in order to really dive deep into their specific concentration and focus. And these three core topics include mechanics, thermodynamics, and kinetics. But before we go in depth about these core topics, we first need to understand the MATSC basics. And so these basics include the crystal structures that make up each material. So every material has a unique crystal structure. For instance, body center cubic, such as BCC, where you have an atom in the center of the cube. Face center cubic, where you have each face has uh, five atoms, except there's no atoms in the middle of the cube. And then there's hexagonal close pack, or HCP, where you have two hexagonal faces with five atoms, three atoms, then five atom layer in the HTP structure. And so that is a unique structure for each crystal structure. And you can see that with understanding these structures, you are able to understand the material properties at a bulk level. After studying these perfect crystal structure formations, we then move on to defects and dislocations where we're looking at, for instance, edge and screw dislocations, looking and characterizing them with Berger's vectors in order to understand how defects can affect material properties, such as ductility. We then go on to equilibrium bond length, where we're looking at how do atoms bond in the first place in order to make their crystal structures. You look at the repulsive and attractive energy, and as the atoms move closer together, they get reach a minimum in the potential energy graph in order to bond and therefore having a, the crystal structure formed over time. And with this um, equilibrium distance, you then start to have repulsive energy if you have the atoms get closer and closer together, and therefore that's why you get an increase in the potential energy graph. Next, we look at phase diagrams. So many materials engineers need to make their materials process more efficient or achieve a certain phase in their material product. And so they use phase diagrams to achieve that. In this graph shown here, you have a pressure versus temperature graph of different water phases. And with this, you might want to design a process that has a certain temperature and pressure to achieve a certain phase of your material, in this case, water. And so for instance, if I have less than 0 0.01 temperature and I have um, one atmosphere pressure, I would be able to get ice. And so um, from this graph, I can get what kind of process and conditions do I need in order to achieve what I want. There are more complicated phase diagrams. One of the more common ones that many material engineers work with is with the iron carbon phase diagram because you're able to form different kinds of steel. So if, as shown, you can see the y-axis is temperature, the x-axis is composition, and you can see that as 
you vary the composition, you get different kinds of uh, material properties. With steel, you can get um, different kinds of hardness and uh, ductility. You can also get different kinds of cast iron as you increase the amount of carbon. And um, you can design different structural properties based on what kind of composition or temperature you're processing the material at. And so with these basic topics, we then dive more deep into the core topics. The first core topic is mechanics. And so many materials engineers, they want to try to understand what kind of stresses, strength, um, hardness, toughness do different materials have in order to understand how they can design on a larger scale different applications such as for buildings or ships, etc. And so the left image shows a polycrystalline material with different grains. And um, based on the grain size, you will learn that you can get different strengths and different mechanical properties. On the right, it shows different crystal structure materials. And based on the crystal structure, you can also achieve certain strength mechanics, as well as uh, certain resistance to creep deformation, which is a significant problem, especially with uh, different metals and trying to um, put these metals through certain stress and temperature conditions. One common way of testing for strength is called the tensile strength test, where you're clamping a certain beam, uh, small material of metal, and you are stretching it in the vertical direction in order to get the stress strain curve. Based on the stress strain curve, you can then determine where the yield strength is, ultimate strength is, and then fracture where you're completely breaking material into two halves or even more and be able to understand what stress conditions does the material break and therefore this would be really useful information to design for certain product applications. On a lab level, uh, we show here on this image the clamps on the metal and stretching it in the vertical direction in order to, uh, as shown in the arrow, first find that yield strength and then beyond that you'd be able to get fracture as shown here where it's a failure uh, type of brittle or ductile so you can be able to determine if this is a brittle material based on how it breaks as shown in B and C you can see that it's ductile because there's necking or there's narrowing of the material at the breaking point versus at brittle with A, uh, it just breaks into half. And so you can tell from these visually whether it's ductile and uh, whether it's something that you want in your material for a certain product that you are trying to apply it for. Another core topic is thermodynamics. And so a common uh, thing and phenomenon that materials engineers look at is Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy constitutes internal energy, entropy, temperature, pressure, and volume. And with this Gibbs free energy, you can start to calculate the change in Gibbs free energy using the enthalpy, entropy, and temperature in order to understand whether your reaction is spontaneous or not. And in order to determine if it's spontaneous, you can determine this by the sign of delta G. So if you have a negative sign, you have a spontaneous reaction for with the negative delta G. And this then shows that this reaction would occur spontaneously or auto almost automatically with the conditions that you're putting it at. Therefore, you'd be able to achieve the specific material product that you want um, and therefore maximize that amount of production in order to achieve um, a maximum and cost-effective amount of material that you're getting with this reaction. In addition to spontaneity, you can also determine and graph the phase diagram using Gibbs free energy. And so on the left graph, you can see Gibbs energy versus composition and uh, using the tangent line construction in order to form and graph the phase diagram uh, that we saw in the previous slides to determine what kind of material processes in order to achieve specific phases that we desire. And then finally, the third core topic is kinetics. And so kinetics is important because it tells the engineer how much time it takes for a reaction to occur, depending on if the reaction is reaction or diffusion limited, um, whether it is needs to use specific surface energies to overcome, etc. And so to distinguish between kinetics and thermodynamics, we can look at the left graph, where the thermodynamics determines um, how spontaneous the reaction is to occur. And the kinetics then determines how fast does the reaction occur. And so there is a difference between the two in that thermodynamics shows uh, whether the reaction will occur almost automatically with the conditions that are given and uh, whether that reaction will be quick or not. 
some spontaneous reactions are extremely slow and may not be uh, what you want in your manufacturing process or whatever materials process you're trying to achieve because you want to have a quick reaction and have a lot of this specific product material that you want. And so understanding these thermodynamic and kinetic interactions are important for a materials engineer. The right graph shows how to determine whether there is diffusion or reaction limited. Sometimes your reaction may be slow because it takes a long time for the reagents to come to that together and react, so it's diffusion limited. Or it's reaction limited because the reaction itself is slow. And so understanding these are important in order to design material processes for the application that you want. And so combining all of these three core topics, we can then now dive deeper into the specific concentrations that I talked about before. I want to first remind about the crystal structures. These are really important to understand in order to really fundamentally understand how materials interact and why they have the properties that they do. In order to characterize materials, many engineers use x-ray diffraction, where you have an x-ray of a certain wavelength incident onto a sample, which is then diffracting this x-ray beam into a detector, and then this detector then is able to uh, find a certain intensity for the specific angle that you're having the beam incident onto the sample. And this can then be used as information to determine what material you're looking at, their crystal structure, and um, even more than that. And in order to understand that, we can look at the schematic where you have an x-ray source at a certain angle incident onto the sample, and this beam is then diffracted onto the detector, which then is able to extract certain information. And so to look at that more mathematically, uh, this, phenom this phenomenon, this instrument is using Bragg's law and lambda is equal to 2d sine theta, where lambda is the wavelength of the x-ray, d is the spacing between the atoms in the and atom plane um, in the sample, and then you have theta, which is the angle which the x-ray source is incident onto the sample. And so from these variables, we already know the lambda and sine theta, um, we just don't know d. And so from the detector and the intensities that we measure, we are able to find d, the d spacing between the atomic planes, and therefore be able to determine the, the lattice constant in the crystal structure, and then determine uh, what material based on the x-ray diffraction measurements as well as the d spacing. And so to understand that more on an experimental level, this is a graph showing intensity versus diffraction angle. And you can see that at certain intensities, you get certain peaks uh, with certain diffraction angles. And based on that, you can determine Miller indices or the specific material planes that you're being incident on and diffracting the beam to the detector. And from this, you can determine uh, based on comparison with reference data, what kind of material you have, as well as the despacing and uh, what kind of crystal structure you have. And based on this, you can determine that this is a sodium chloride powder with an FCC structure from um, this data. And so this is really important to understand to be able to identify and characterize different materials. In addition, many use scanning electron microscope or SEM. And how this works is if you zoom in to the inside to understand what's going on, you can see that there is an electron beam that is incident onto a sample. And with this electron beam incident onto the sample, you start to have a teardrop kind of image where you have the different radiation um, at certain depths in the sample. And so on the more surface part of the sample, you can get OJ electrons, secondary electrons, and backscatter electrons that are useful for imaging the sample at a micron and nanometer level. And so to visualize that, we have an example of an electronic device showing that with different densities because of the different materials, you can tell based on the gray shading that there are different uh, materials combined in this device. And you can also determine uh, based on the visualization of the image, which materials they are, as well as uh, based on the scale, how big these features are. And so this is really important to um, understand on a more higher resolution visually uh, where your specific materials are on your device and um, different kinds of materials characterization with SEM, which can be further explored 
with other materials instruments, such as with SEM, EDS, electron dispersion spectroscopy, trying to understand composition um, in the device or whatever material that you're imaging in the SEM. You can also look at transition electron microscopy for um, atomic level imaging, as well as X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, XPS, to understand composition of the material, SIMS, EELS, E-L-S, and profilometer to determine thickness of different kind of material samples, as well as other material instruments based on what kind of application or variable that you're looking at. For instance, for electronic devices, you can use a four-point probe to understand the Hall effect, as well as the mobility and conductivity. So there, there are different material instruments that you can use for different kind of material properties and characterization. Further material topics are listed here for what I didn't cover. However, these are concepts that are definitely important for a materials engineer to understand and get familiar with. For mechanics, I definitely recommend trying to familiarize with the lever rule, um, the TTT diagram. Thermodynamics is really important to understand the different models as well as, uh, for instance, the hall patch relationship, understanding how solids can affect strength. You can also look at electronics, understanding what is the Schrodinger equation, Drude model, uncertainty principle, band structure graphs, as well as kinetics, understanding the equilibrium K constant, uh, different nucleation and growth processing, uh, as well as the diffusion profiles, surface and interface reactions, and all these topics um, come together to really understand on a fundamental level how material mechanisms and material properties are achieved uh, for different design processes and applications. So with that, um, there are different resources that I found to be really helpful as I went through college, trying to understand different complicated concepts, uh, especially when you are at an atomic level, it can be hard to visualize. And so I like to visit these kind of websites to understand visually how these materials and mechanisms and properties work, especially for characterization methods. There are also different material companies that you can look into. Um, materials engineers can be anywhere, can be engaged in anything that involves with uh, designing or manufacturing any kind of material. And so I recommend uh, looking further into how you can explore materials and um, any companies or research fields as well. And so with that, these are my references. If you find that this information has been helpful, please like and subscribe for more videos. Uh, especially if you would like me to cover more materials engineering concepts that I haven't covered in this video, please comment down below and I'll try to make sure to make some concise videos for the future. Thank you.